Welcome back. It's still TV3 New Day, and it's still all about coronavirus. Now, when you check the other developed countries, you'd realize that as much as, you know, they have all the PPEs, even their health professionals are complaining that there are lack of PPEs. There's also a strain on ventilators in those countries as well. And so they've had to find ways to come up with their own ventilators and also to get some um, from China. Here in Ghana, our numbers are still rising steadily. At the moment, we have 287 confirmed cases. And as much as we've been focusing on educating the public and also providing PPEs to our health professionals, there has been a growing concern about the lack of ventilators in the country. We know that there are about 200 of them according to government and also about 307 of them found in uh, the new ambulances that were provided by government a month ago. Now these ambulances with the ventilators in there, they are described as mini ventilators that only serve as support system um, for the patients until they get to the main hospitals. And so if our numbers should rise, do we have enough ventilators to take care of our patients and our cases. As a result, um, a lot of individuals have come up with ways to develop their ventilators. And we have Professor Fred McBangon Lurie, who is a professor at, uh, he's a president of Academic City University College. And he is one of the people who's been able to rally some medical professionals and students to come up with ventilators just to supplement what we have in government at the moment. Good morning, Professor, and thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's an honor having you on TV3 New Day. First of all, I want to find out, at what point did you decide to start making ventilators? Is this something you've been working on for a long time, or did it arise as a, you know, a result of the need for ventilators in the country? So this arose as a result of the need for ventilators uh, in the country. Uh, we just started looking at this a little over a week ago. Okay. Um, Obviously, we were all concerned uh, at the pandemic and also the ongoing discussions that we didn't have enough uh, ventilators in the system. So we decided to put a team together to see what we could do. And within a week, you've been able to come up with some ventilators? We've come up with a, a good concept. Okay. Uh, 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 of course, the product development cycle requires that you go from a concept to a prototype. So we have a prototype. Um, and the next natural step for a prototype is to turn it into a product. Okay, so you have a pro prototype. Please explain yeah. to me, because for a lot of people watching, I'm sure the belief is that, okay, we have a ventilator. So then if you have a prototype, how does this work? And what do we require before it you know, comes out as a full ventilator where patients can use it? Yeah, so a prototype is essentially uh, the result of ideation. So you will first have to look at the underlying um, biology or chemistry or physics of a disease condition. Um, and then you try to figure out how to solve that with mm. the system. And so once you kind of figure out what to do with the system, you put that system together and then you test the system to see if it can actually solve the problem. Yeah. Once you're convinced that it can solve the problem, uh, you call that a prototype. Yeah. And then the next natural step is to actually build a complete one by using the exact parts that will go into the hospital version um, that will go into the patient. And that is where we are right now. The next natural step is to take that prototype and turn it into a into product. Into a proper ventilator. Product. These parts, are they sourced locally or have we had to import some of them um, initially just to put them together? So everything we've used um, is local. Okay. We went to went to a few plumbing shops. We went into the open market. We went into some car parts, um, old car part dealerships, and got motors from it to prove that we actually have a system that can generate and push air into an ailing lung. Okay. And and get the person stabilized. So we can prove that uh, we have a system that can do exactly that. Okay, so somewhere in the U.S., I know that they also have uh, come up with some simple ventilators that are also low cost. And I believe that's one of uh, the types that you are producing as well. But theirs runs on a windshield wiper motor. Now, I want yeah. to find out, is that the same thing you're producing or what is yours driven by? So we have actually three key sources of, you know, inputs uh, into our system. One is a windshield windshield wiper okay. for sure. 
uh, because it provides the mechanism you need to actually push, uh, um, a, you know, a wind producing system, whether it's an ambu bag or whether it's bellows. Mm. And it's easy to find. Uh, we pulled one off an old Ford vehicle. So that is one mechanism. We okay. also have a piston driven mechanism. Um, we have a rack and pinion driven uh, mechanism. And the next mechanism we, we're looking at is to use oxygen, okay. pressurized oxygen, to actually drive the system. Okay. Those are some terms that I, I don't exactly get, but <laughs> I believe that you understand exactly what you're doing. But what I want to find out is how the ventilator works generally works. Okay. on a patient. How is it run? Okay. Okay. So, look, the simple answer is that it's an artificial lung. Okay. Uh, the, no the normal human adult... Um, has to take 12 to about 20 breaths in a minute. So if they are not able to take the minimum of 12 breaths per minute, or they exceed the 20 breaths per minute, um, uh, per minute then you have a disease condition where the, fun the lungs are not functioning the mm. way that they ought to. And in situations like that, you need assistive breathing. Okay. okay. That is when the ventilator comes in. And so if you look at a typical hospital ventilator, you have an air source. Mm. Uh, it could be oxygen. It could be a mixture of oxygen and medical air. And you pass this through a humidifier, uh, essentially a moisturizer. Okay. okay. And that adds a little um, water to the air to, to prevent it from being too dry. Okay. Mm. And then this goes into the lungs. So that's the inspiration phase. Okay. Now, from the lungs, it goes into what we call a positive end expiratory pressure system. And what this does is to prevent the lungs from collapsing when the patient expires. So All when right. they breathe out, mm -hmm. you don't want them to empty their lungs completely. Okay. So you maintain some sort of balance between this peep and the lungs. And of course, in the in the in the mechanical terms, you want to make sure that the pressure in that peep is not lower than atmospheric pressure. Otherwise, as soon as the person breathes out, their lungs will collapse. All right, all right. And then when air comes out of that peep, so maintaining a normal function of the lung, it goes into what we call a scrubber, and the scrubber is where the germs are killed. Mm. before you allow the expired air to get into the atmosphere. I see. So the repeater cycle that the lungs go through until the patient is a little responsive. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen in the case of coronavirus is that a normal functioning lung, which has alveoli, which carries pockets of air, they begin to collapse. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have some alveoli that are in normal condition, you have some that are completely collapsed, yeah. and you have that are half collapsed. Mm -hmm. So your job, or the, the job of that ventilator, is to ensure that you can bring the collapsed uh, alveoli back and up, back. Okay. fill up the ones that are partially empty, and just preserve the ones that are normal. Okay. And does this process run on electricity? Do you have to connect your ventilators to the electricity? And I'm asking this because as much as we know the president has instructed um, you know, the power suppliers to ensure that we have a regular power supply, we do understand that there are still some areas that still have power failure. And so in this case, if it should be connected to electricity and God forbid it goes off, what happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are looking at a couple of things. So the basic infrastructure... Uh, which is essentially the air production and expiration system. Yeah. It's complete. Okay. Now, your power part comes in as to how you drive this mechanism. In our case, we've made allowance for electricity. Mm. We've made allowance for a battery. Okay. Uh, we've made allowance for a manual. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a manual system where... Desperate families can just stand there and push up and down the piston to generate air. Uh, okay. And so, and it, go ahead. No, I'm listening to you. Go ahead. I was going to ask that with a manual. I mean, if I have to stand there and you know manually operate yeah. this machine, how long am I going to have to be at one place making sure that this still pumps air into the lungs? 
Well, you know, if you've spent time in ICUs, yeah. you will see a lot of desperate, desperate uh, family members who are ready to keep somebody online. So in, in our case, you know, you can have people take turns. Okay, okay. All right. Still up and down, you know, if you can do 20 turns and move, somebody else can grab onto it. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to develop a low cost mm. without the whistles and bells uh, that can easily be assembled in the field and mostly using repurposed local materials. Okay. So, for instance, one of our mechanisms works off a leather bag. I see. Typical Ghana produced leather. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that is driven off by the, um, the windshield wiper motor. You know? So we can produce a very, very low cost, uh, easy to use, out in the field, 25 minutes of assembly um, to keep somebody alive. How many of them do you think you can produce? I mean, you said that you've produced a prototype and you're looking forward to making the proper ventilator. How long do yeah. you require to make a certain number? And, you know, exactly how long will it take? Okay. So a ventilator is what we'll call a class one medical device. Yeah. Uh, because it's going to come into contact with a human being. Um, it's going to be inserted, inserted into a human being. So for class one devices the FDA requires you to meet certain conditions yeah. okay, to show that, you know, you will not, uh, uh, you will not adversely affect uh, people's lives, you know. Mm. So it, it, it's usually the validation process, uh, the verif verification and validation process uh, that have to subject, that have to be subjected to regulatory constraints. Okay. And that some take a while. All right. Uh, but of course, I mean, having the resources, Available to us, I think within the next month, we could have a functioning uh, prototype that you can actually put to human subjects. I see. And has government reached out in terms of um, helping out or ensuring that you produce enough for the hospitals as well? Uh, we are still waiting to hear. Uh, we, we've obviously gotten some support. Uh, Professor Fripon Boateng was kind enough to uh, provide us a letter that we could move around and mobilize the team. Um, I have had some brief conversations with folks at the Infectious Diseases uh, Division yes. of the okay. Health Ministry. All right. Uh, but that's about it for now. If you are asked to do it for free, would you consider that? Well, that's that's the intention. Um, okay. Uh, this is a this is a call to duty. It's it's by no means an attempt to to enrich. Okay, okay, all right. Well, Professor, thank you so much for speaking to us, and we wish you the very best. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've been speaking to Professor Fred McBagon Louis, mm -hmm. and he's the president of the Academic City University College, mm -hmm. and they are developing low cost ventilators mm -hmm. to support the few that we have as well. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think he should be supported. Yeah. I think he mentioned that uh, Professor Frimpong has, has sent a letter. Know, yes. yes. So I think he should be supported. Like, I mean, we've been saying here on this platform, this is the time for us to look within. Exactly. And look at what we can do for ourselves. Yeah. You know, so I think kudos to him. Definitely. Kudos to him. And I mean, mm. aside him, yesterday I got a tweet from a young man that I've interviewed before. He's an old student of Ashesi University. Okay. And he has a tech company. Mm -hmm. I think he's rallied a few young people. Mm -hmm. And what they've come up with is, first of all, they've identified the problem with okay. the Veronica bucket and the taps. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, you realize that you have to manually open, open the tap. Open it, yeah. And if you wash your hands, you may have to touch the tap again. Yeah. And there could be a possible reinfection. And so they've come up with a tap. A system. Uh, what do you call it? Motionless tap or motion tap. I'm not okay. sure what to call it. And so once you put your hand, your hand under there, the tap, it's able to. It's a sensor. It's, it's a, a sensor, sensor exactly. Yeah. So then the water just flows, ah. and then once you move your hands, it stops. It stops. And so uh, they are advocating for, for governments support. to also, you know, uh, get a few of their taps ah. to try on the Veronica buckets because the you Veronica, see that a lot of people yeah. use it at a time. At a time. So if it's at it's one brilliant, place, it be, Bella. Exactly. Because when you look at uh, when you go to the various hotels, you see the sensor where exactly. you have to dry your hand. Mm -hmm. So I think he uses the same method. Probably. I think. Probably that. Ah. And aside him also, we have that young man who came up with the, um, the solar system, you know, tap on tap. the, what do you call that thing? Ah, there was a video of it. I don't oh, know okay. if you've seen it. Okay, no, I haven't. Oh, you seen haven't. It. Okay. okay, well, maybe if we're lucky, oh, yeah. our producers yeah. might show the video. Show the video. Okay. So, a lot of people are coming up with very it great ideas timing. 
of how to fight coronavirus, whether yeah. it's a ventilator mm -hmm. or it's a way by which you can wash your hands. Mm -hmm. And there's also an opportunity for you to think, look within, then, see yeah. what you can also come up with. You know, if you have to produce face masks, go ahead you should. and do it. I, and that's why I got excited when the president, you know, mentioned that we're going to start producing our own face masks, you know, and all that, and they are engaging, you know, some five companies. We are told that 150. A uh, thousand ventilators a day, um, I mean, face masks a day. A day. I, I mean, they started yesterday, so I'm hoping that we'll hear news of some in the system, you know. Uh, this, the good news for me here is that we're beginning to look within. We're beginning to support local producers to produce what we need. I mean, if you're really beyond aid, we're really working towards empowering the local Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we will have issues with our Ghana city at all. I'm really hoping that we'll go beyond aid, you know. So kudos to all those who are in their own small ways supporting the country in this uh, these trying times.